You mean I can be a Dick Smith with kids, too? Dick Smith, the electronic wizard in the electronic land of Oz. And there's a store near you. Dick Smith. Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 807 for the 24th of March, 2024. Richard Saunders coming to you from the Skeptic Zone studios here in Sydney, Australia. And that little bit at the beginning of the show was a TV advertisement from the early 1980s, around 82 or 84, something like that, for Dick Smith Electronics. And the reason I'm playing that is in uh, within the past week, Dick Smith himself one of the founders and the patron of Australian Skeptics, turned 80 years old. Happy birthday, Dick. The first segment of The Skeptic Zone is dedicated to Dick Smith and his involvement in the skeptical movement here in Australia. He was a key figure, a key figure, bringing James Randi to Australia in 1980 to conduct water divining tests and then helping to uh, to start the Australian skeptical movement. Included in the uh, tribute coming up are excerpts from various uh, TV shows and videos featuring James the Amazing Randy. Of course, Dick Smith and James Randy were great friends for decades. And to this day, Dick Smith has a keen interest in the Australian skeptics. In fact, I have the great pleasure of chatting to Dick occasionally on subjects such as uh, UFOs. And speaking of UFOs, in the Trove segment at the end of the uh, program today... We look once more, look once more up into the skies or back into history and see what reports we can find about UFOs in the Australian press. Also on today's show, we review the latest issue of the Australian Skeptics magazine, The Skeptic, the journal from Australian Skeptics, including a report by me on power balance wristbands and their ilk after all these years. And also on today's episode, it's the return of the Book of Tim. The Book of Tim, and he's going to be looking at uh, the myth that you can tell if somebody is staring at you. Stay tuned. Don't turn off at the end of the episode for more announcements from me. But now it's time for me to run downstairs and have a nice... mm -hmm, What will it be? How about a nice cup of iced tea? Because it's a warm day and a bit of toast. Well, I do that. I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Growing up through the 1970s and 1980s, one of the major electronic stores in Australia, without doubt, was the Dick Smith chain of uh, stores, Dick Smith Electronics, founded by the larger-than-life character of Dick Smith himself. And until roughly 1980, that's all I really knew about Dick Smith. He was uh, the man behind the Dick Smith Electronics, and sometimes he was known for pulling interesting publicity stunts. And if I refer quickly to the Museum of Hoaxes, 
Online we have the Sydney Iceberg, April Fool's Day, 1978. On the morning of April the 1st, 1978, a barge appeared in Sydney Harbour, towing a giant iceberg. Sydney siders, as residents of Sydney are known, were expecting it. Dick Smith, a local adventurer and millionaire businessman, owner of Dick Smith Foods and Dick Smith Electronics, had been loudly promoting his scheme to tow an iceberg from Antarctica for quite some time. Now, he apparently succeeded. Smith said he was going to moor the iceberg near the Sydney Opera House and then carve the berg into small ice cubes, which he would sell to the public for 10 cents each. (laughs) These well-travelled cubes, fresh from the pure waters of Antarctica, were promised to improve the flavour of any drink they cooled. The cubes would be marketed under the brand name Dixicles. It goes on to say, apparently though, when this uh, ice cube Berg, so-called iceberg, was being towed into the harbour. It began to rain. It says here the water washed away the firefighting foam and the shaving cream that the iceberg was really made of, exposing the white plastic sheets beneath. Later it says Smith estimated the entire stunt cost him about $1,450, which was not a small sum in 1978, which he felt was cheap for the amount of publicity it gained. Dick Smith is also known as probably Australia's greatest adventurer. He was the first man to fly a helicopter around the world. He's done that several times, including trips to the Arctic and the Antarctic. Other famous adventures included balloon rides across Australia and across the Tasman between Australia and New Zealand. Dick has had three major business undertakings during his career. Dick Smith Electronics, of course, which was hugely successful. Then Dick founded... Australian Geographic magazine, and finally Dick Smith Foods. And I used to really enjoy your crunchy peanut butter, Dick, if you're listening. But apart from all this, of course, our interest in Dick Smith is because he was the founder or one of the driving forces behind the formation of Australian Skeptics in 1980. He flew James Randi to Australia to conduct a series of very famous water divining tests, which turned into the documentary for television James Randi in Australia, which I'll link to in the show notes. And whenever I give a talk about any subject anywhere in the world, I recommend people go to YouTube to watch James Randi in Australia, the documentary. It's a classic piece of how to conduct an investigation, a test into a claim. A couple of years ago, Australian Skeptics conducted some interviews with Dick Smith and other people about the formation of Australian Skeptics, and here is an excerpt from that video with Dick talking about the early days. Yes, I think I read in the Bulletin magazine, which is a famous old magazine in Australia, came out, I think it was weekly, uh, that there was an organisation called Psychop, and uh, they had a magazine that ended up being called The Skeptical Inquirer, and I became a subscriber. And then one day I saw a letter and it was from a Mark Plummer in Melbourne who said that he was an Australian member and we should have an organisation going like this in Australia and were there any other subscribers who may be interested in joining him. I see, so it was that letter in the magazine that put you originally in contact with Mark Plummer. Absolutely right. I'd never heard of Mark Plummer. He was a suburban solicitor in Melbourne, but with similar sceptical views to me. It's interesting, when I was about six years of age, I came home from scripture class and I said to my mother, uh, Mum, uh, the, uh, the t- scripture teacher says there's God on everyone's shoulder, but there's hundreds of people in the world, that would be impossible. And she said to me, well, look, you've just got to have faith. And I've never had faith without evidence. So that was the start of it. I then contacted Mark Plummer in Melbourne and uh, we said, in fact, I said to Mark, why don't I bring James Randi? We'd read a lot about James Randi. Why don't I bring him to Australia? And he thought that was a great idea. So we brought James Randi to Australia. He became quite famous here because of the the incident on the Don Lane show. And then uh, we set up the Australian Skeptics. So who, who came up with the name? then Australian skeptics or was just a natural thing to call it? It was a natural thing but it was mainly Mark Plummer Uh and James Durand who in Melbourne who came up with the name and actually got the operation going. At the stage of Randy coming out and it was only because we got that publicity that Mark Plummer said look Dick I'll set up a branch 
do you want to become a member? I said, of course I do. And he said, in fact, we'll make you and Philip Adams the founding patrons. And so we agreed. And in fact, I think we took a couple of thousand dollars from the sale of the film to help Mark with some of the original costs. And he got James Durand and uh, they worked together and basically set the sceptical movement in Australia up there in Melbourne with all of us as members. In this excerpt from James Randi in Australia, we hear Dick Smith chatting to James Randi and Dick Smith was expressing his concerns that if they conducted tests of water diviners and the water diviners failed, that would really hurt the credibility of the water diviners. What what do you reckon they'll say, you know, if they fail? Yeah, well, they're all the rationalizations. Oh, the rationalizations. Oh, rationalization. You'll be amazed what they come up with as rationalizations. They'll, they'll invoke astrological signs, unfortunate aspects of the moon, all kinds of things. And uh, also they'll say negative vibrations. For yeah, but, but wait a second. How can they do that? If they get a sign with us, the actual, if they get a sign and say that they're very happy and they've checked a bit of pipe, doesn't make much difference. They'll find a rationalization. Now, I've been 35 years in this business, and you'd think that I'd be able to come up with all the rationalization. I'm surprised. Yeah. The Dowsers particularly are very adept at this. Now, to you and me, to yeah. reasonable, rational, logical people, they have failed, and there doesn't seem to be any such power. But to them, they're not acting logically. So what, what frustrates me is what's the use of doing this if they, we're not going to... It's true. The only thing you can do, and the only person you're going to convince of it, is, I think, particularly the younger generation, who are on the verge. They say, I wonder, does such a thing really happen? happen or not. The old timers who have believed in this all of their life, they're not going to change. No. Tell, tell me, does, do you think, you know, if, if people believe in these things, is there any harm even if they are deluding themselves? Of course there is. There's an enormous amount of harm in any kind of lie or deception. Whether it's political, whether it's scientific, it makes no difference. I think I've got a general uh, principle in life that deception is a uh, is a harmful element in life and uh, if a younger generation is um, raised to believe that there are things that go bump in the night that there are marvelous things that can happen to them if only they'll uh, subscribe to the Maharishi or whatever then I think we've got a very big problem of course James Randi knew what he was talking about and 44 years later it is still the case that no matter how many times a believer, a true believer, whatever they believe in, fails, they keep right on believing regardless. In fact, sometimes it even reinforces their belief. Of course, Dick Smith and James Randi were great friends, and in 1997, Dick Smith was honored with a This Is Your Life television show. In fact, I think I think he had two over his careers, two This Is Your Life television shows. And in this occasion, the producers flew James Randi over from Florida to surprise Dick Smith. Now, Dick, there's one great friend who wouldn't miss being here tonight for anything, even if that meant us flying him all the way from Florida to be here. It's the well-known international skeptic, James Randi. Oh. Oh, that one. <laughs> now, James, this man's helped you out a bit, hasn't he? Yes, I came a long way just to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. As a matter of fact, uh, Dick sort of rescued me at one point. I was being sued by Mr. Uri Geller. You may remember him, the spoon bender. What a profession. <laughs> and um, Mr. Geller was suing me, in fact, in different parts of the world. And I almost had to give up the defense. And uh, then one day something happened. But first, I'd like to show you the silly trick upon which this is all based. They gave me some spoons the here. Spoons. Oh, they've got them all sealed up, hermetically sealed. <laughs> An official envelope. And uh, he just loves this trick. But you're just going to use magic, aren't you? Yeah, well, I'll just use uh, <laughs> a little skullduggery here, perhaps. Uh, these are stainless steel spoons, you can tell from the sound of them. And uh, I'm just going to hold this spoon like this and uh, give it a gentle stroke. Now, the illusion is very strong, ladies and gentlemen. Some people in the audience even seem to think that the spoon is actually getting rubbery and bending. That's all an illusion, strictly in your mind, of course. Some people even tell me that it bends to the point where it gets wobbly and turns into rubber, sort of. What a profession. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Hold out your hand, would you, Dick? A miracle. I don't know how it's done, and I don't care. <laughs> Well, this is what started me into scepticism, because it was seeing Uri Geller do it, and I thought it was, 
you know, scientific, but it appears it's just magic. What I did here was a trick. When Mr. Gellery does it, he says it's a divine power. I did it without divine power. Can you imagine that? And I must say that uh, when I was very short of money there, I didn't ask for it. Dick didn't announce it. But suddenly, at my home in the United States, an envelope arrived. I opened it. No comment inside, just a check for a rather substantial amount of money. Now, you may think you're a very fortunate man. We're the fortunate ones, Dick, because you believe not only in people, but you believe in your country, and you believe, more importantly, in yourself. That's Mr. Smith. Aren't you kind? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Incidentally, it was shortly after the taping of that program, where Randy was flown over to greet Dick Smith, that I met James Randy for the first time. In fact, I've got uh, his autograph and Dick Smith's autograph from 1997, when I went to uh, see a public talk given by James Randi during his visit to Sydney. So a warm and genuine happy birthday to Dick Smith. I had the great pleasure to be at Dick Smith's 80th birthday party on the very day, Dick Smith's 80th birthday, and it was wonderful to shake the man's hand and thank him in person. And there were extremely heartfelt and uh, glowing tributes from his uh, friends and family. And we learnt that uh, over the course of his career, Dick Smith has been exceptionally generous in his donations to worthy causes. And finally, a personal note of thanks to Dick Smith, because he is a supporter of the Skeptic Zone and continues to be the patron and supporter of Australian Skeptics. better at telling if people are lying it's really simple what you need to do it's real well actually funny you should ask that because what i've how discovered... do i improve my memory i've got this great trick can you make me happier okay look for answers to a thousand questions about the incredible world of human behavior and the psychology of everyday life join me psychologist richard wiseman and me science journalist marnie chesterton on richard wiseman's on your mind a new podcast from podimo and telltale can i win the lottery probably not subscribe to the skeptic magazine the journal from australian skeptics i have here in front of me the very latest issue volume 44 number one march 2024 volume 44 means this magazine has been going for 44 years the quarterly magazine you can subscribe at skeptics.com.au and if you uh, subscribe to the physical copy it comes delivered to your uh, address. You can read it on the train, in the bath, wherever you want to read it. Or, for half the price, you can subscribe to the digital copy, which will arrive in your email. And if you happen to subscribe to the physical copy, you get the digital copy for free anyway. The current issue deals with things like the media's role in uh, helping to, uh, well, not fight misinformation and that's a story by tim mendham it's called media culpa tim mendham asks how the media cope with science and just as importantly cope with pseudoscience and how big is the too hard basket we have a story by dr sue Yurachi called the acid test around the traps which is a current uh, roundup of uh, global skeptical news and a review of the Australian Skeptics National Convention held in Melbourne late last year. But I'll draw your attention and I'll mention briefly a report by myself called Broken Breakthroughs. And this is about the small devices, usually wristbands, that promise to improve your balance, your strength and so on. And this story really does focus on the new kid on the block, which is called Tau Patch, T-A-O-P-A-T-H, which is a very expensive little dot you wear about your person. 
So I'll read an excerpt from the report. For the full report, of course, all you need to do is to uh, subscribe to the magazine. Wearable Medical Devices The late 2000s saw an explosion in so-called power bands, with the now discredited company Power Balance leading the charge in 2009. Each of these products, be they rubber wristbands with holograms, mass-produced in China for around 10 cents each, credit card-sized cards, also with holograms, patches, pendants, or other small wearable devices, followed and still follow a similar pattern. Point. All one needs do is to wear the device for it to have beneficial physiological effects, that is, improve your balance, increase your core strength, and give you more flexibility. In some cases, all one needs do is to have the device in one's pocket. Other vague claims include better concentration, increased blood flow, greater stamina, more vitality, and many others. Point. Some beneficial effects could be dramatically demonstrated on the spot to defeat skepticism via so-called body tests. The effect was instant, making for quick demonstrations on TV and or at trade-slash-sporting shows, shopping malls and fairs. These tests, which have since been well and truly debunked, it is the person demonstrating the device who directs their force in different directions, typically includes pushing down on the subject's arm before and after the introduction of the device. Tau Patch features these tests on its promotional videos. The tests are a variation of applied kinesiology muscle testing, a discredited alternative health modality. Point. The devices use new or, quote, breakthrough, end quote, micro, nano, quantum, or other technologies that somehow tap into the so-called, quote, natural energies or frequencies, end quote. These technologies are unknown to science and not subject to independent verification. Any one of these devices, if they worked, would truly represent a staggering breakthrough in science. So far, this has not been the case, and no one behind these products has lined up for their Nobel Prize in physics or medicine. Point. Many of these devices were and still are mass-produced in China with holograms similar to those found in credit cards. There is no research or theory that would suggest holograms could conduct energies to have beneficial effects on the human body. However, they do look futuristic. Point. As the various devices listed below, and later on in the story I list many of them, listed below were shown to be scams, it follows that people at the top of the products may known full well that the devices were useless and just made up the bogus science using scientific terms for marketing purposes. Point. Terms such as frequencies, energy field, quantum, vibrations and other scientific words were used out of context in promoting the devices. The promoters rely on the general ignorance of the consumer. Point. Local distributors, who typically had little scientific knowledge, could also be duped into thinking these devices really worked as claimed, even to the point of their not realizing they themselves were skewing the body balance and strength tests. We suspect this was the case with the Australian distributor of Power Balance. Point. Endorsements from various medical professionals, such as chiropractors and even physicians. Point. Endorsements from high-profile sporting personalities and everyday people. Point. A short burst of popularity, followed by disappearance from the market. And then I go on to list quite a number of these products that were on sale here in Australia over the past 15 years. Now, that report actually goes over four pages. And so you'll just have to, uh, as I say, you'll just have to subscribe to the magazine to read the rest of that report and my conclusions. The Skeptic Magazine, the journal from Australian skeptics, certainly one of the greatest skeptical publications in all of recorded history. And it can be yours, delivered to your address or to your inbox 
four times a year. Simply go to skeptics.com.au and sign up today. G'day, Dr. Carl here, popping up on your beloved Richard Saunders podcast, inviting you to follow me on TikTok, where things are much faster. And it all has to happen in a minute or less. So why do diet drinks get you drunker? For example, a rum and diet cola versus a rum and regular cola. Why do we hear the ocean in a seashell? Is coffee good or bad for you? With regard to farts, what happens when you hold them in? And why do farts smell worse in the shower? And the old wooden spoon, as used in cooking, does have a very porous surface. So in terms of bacteria, is it safe to use? And of course, we all know that destiny shapes our ends, but so do the natural electrical fields that we generate. And marijuana munchies might be related to a 500 million year old mutation that makes eating enjoyable via our natural cannabinoids that our body makes. Just follow me on TikTok at Dr. Carl, D-R-K-A-R-L, to find out the answer to all these questions and more. And now, a reading from the Book of Tim with Tim Mendham. Hi, my name is Tim Bendham. I'm the editor of Australian Skeptics magazine, The Skeptic, and executive officer of Australian Skeptics, Inc. And today I'll be looking at a copy of The Skeptic magazine that dates back to September 2012, which is volume 32, number three. It's an article by a fellow who was a school teacher at the time, Adam Van Langenberg, uh, who's now, I find out, is actually a literary editor. So he's left the teaching profession and gone out. But this is about a scientific experiment that he did in his classes at the time. So it's a good example of teaching critical thinking to kids, a bit of scepticism and a bit of fun at the same time. So we call this It's Behind You. And Adam takes on a, an urban myth and gives it what we call a bucketing. Do you ever get that feeling that you're being stared at? Then when you turn around, you notice somebody looking right at you, sometimes with a knife? I do, says Adam, and I suspect that most other people do as well. There are lots of reasons why this could happen. It could be a case of confirmation bias. If somebody happens to be staring at you, you fold it away as evidence of your psychic powers. If nobody is staring at you, you quickly forget about it. Alternatively, it could simply be that when somebody turns around, you look at them. Your very act of turning around is what is causing people to stare. Either way, having a psychic ability that alerts you whenever you're being observed is the least likely explanation. Recently, I ran an experiment with my skeptic kids, which is members of the Student Skeptical Society at the high school where I teach or taught, to determine if anybody had this power. This was based on a Richard Saunders video I saw a couple of years ago, Can You Tell If Someone Is Staring At You? Nice to know someone watches Richard's videos. Isn't it? I chose six volunteers who each claimed to have experienced the sensation. They sat in numbered chairs where I promptly placed a bucket on each of their heads. I wish this was part of the school uniform. A randomly generated number was projected onto a screen. This told the audience who to stare at. When a new number appeared, everybody in the room was instructed to stare intently at that person for 60 seconds. Any of the bucket wearers who felt that they were being stared at were to raise their hands. The buckets prevented the participants from seeing the number and from being swayed by the actions of others. The participants were aware that the numbers were totally random and that it was entirely possible that they would be selected several times in a row or not at all. They were told they should wait until they felt that they were being stared at. We ran 18 trials, which took us about the entire lunchtime, including time taken to set up and explain the experiment. I recorded the results by marking down which number appeared for each trial and a series of crosses and ticks. A cross meant either raising your hand when you weren't being stared at or failing to raise your hand when you were. A tick only occurred if you raised your hand at the right moment. 
Blank spaces refer to people not raising their hand while not being stared at. Some stared in the traditional way. Others took a more direct approach, raising finger to their temples and concentrating real hard. They were nervous in the first round. Nobody raised their hand. No doubt they were terrified of the jeers they were expecting. Eventually a few hands started raising. Unfortunately, none at the right time. Participant number four remained calm, leaving his hand by his side right up until round seven, when he was actually being stared at. Not only was it a hit, it was a perfect one. Unfortunately, as the trials progressed, his powers left him, causing him to become nothing more than a statistical anomaly. In fact, the results show only one hit in total. Hands were raised a total of 17 times, yet only once was that person actually being stared at. If this had been an actual test, I would have been keeping those kids in at lunchtime. Failures, all of you. It was a fun experiment and a good way to kill a rainy lunchtime. Of course, we can hardly consider this to have been a rigorous scientific study, but it served its purpose. One of the messages I'm trying to get across to my kids is something I once heard Steve Novella say on the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast. Anything that can be observed can be observed scientifically. Anytime somebody claims to have a power of some kind, it can be tested. Anytime. You can tell who's ringing before you pick up the phone. Testable. You know whether or not an envelope will contain bad news. Testable. You can cure somebody's cancer with cabbage supplements. Testable. I aim to be testing more of these types of claims as the weeks go by. If anybody has any requests let me know. And that's It's Behind You by Adam Van Langenberg from September 2012, The Skeptic Magazine, volume 32, number three. And you can read that volume of the magazine and virtually every issue of The Skeptic Magazine by going to our website, skeptics.com.au and click on magazines. We publish every issue apart from the four most recent ones which are reserved for subscribers for you to download for free Uh, that's 43 years now of basically of Skeptic Magazine so that's a lot of reading and it'll keep you busy on a rainy day Hey everyone, this is Adrian Hill and Cap McLeod from Canada here. For those of you who would love an excuse to visit Calgary besides the maple syrup and mountains, the Western Canadian Reason or We Can Reason Conference is happening May the 4th be with you at the University of Calgary downtown campus. But the fun starts happening on Friday, May 3rd, with a Star Wars costume contest, spoon bending, trivia, live comedy and music, all at the Sandman Signature Hotel. If it's anything like last year, it will be awesome. There's a great lineup featuring talks from Dr. Eugenie Scott, Jonathan Jerry, Hemet Mehta, James Fell, the sweary historian, and a keynote from Dr. Cara Santamaria. I heard a rumor that there may be a couple of familiar voices speaking at the conference that are from the Skeptic Zone. Yes, noted pancake-eating expert Richard Saunders will be there. Now, Kat, who else will be there? Oh, and me. (laughs) Is that a selling point? Well, I think it is. And we met at We Can Reason last year, Kat, who knew that a year later we would be working together on so many projects. It has been a wild year. Writing together for Skeptical Inquirer, recording the Skeptic Zone, now speaking at the conference. See what happens when you socialize with your community. A whole world of opportunities opens up. And it is just so much fun hanging out with everyone. I couldn't agree more. I encourage everyone to check out the website at www.wecanreason.com for more information on speakers, hotel, and activities. Hope to see you there, or you might be, you know, sorry. Sorry. (laughs) Now it's time 
once again to go back to those pages at trove at trove.nla.gov.au, the online resource from the Government of Australia and the National Library of Australia and other resources around the internet, in libraries, wherever archives are kept. Newspaper archives, magazine archives, periodicals, tabloids, that sort of thing. And we raid them, we investigate, we peruse them, we search them, we rake them. (laughs) I should have a thesaurus handy by my studio desk to find references to sceptical topics. And this week, we're once again hitching a ride in a UFO. It's the gift that just keeps on giving the uh, the far-fetched, unlikely claim that uh, never goes away. Although, oddly enough, in all the far-fetched, unlikely claims we uh, investigate, you sort of have to think that at least, at least, aliens visiting Earth is plausible, if extremely unlikely. Nevertheless, let's see what we can find in some newspaper and other archives. And we get into our UFO, which is also a time machine, and we end up in the year 1991, over 30 years ago, on the 7th of September, in the pages of the Sydney Morning Herald. A story by Deborah Smith, science writer. They've landed. UFO experts seen here. A photo of an alien taken by a former British police officer who was abducted by extraterrestrials will be one of the highlights of a two-day international UFO conference at the Siebel Townhouse in Sydney this weekend. This copyrighted photo was one of the, quote, tantalizing bits of objectivity, end quote, among the many subjective reports of encounters with aliens. Mrs. Jenny Randalls, a key speaker from Britain who has written 14 UFO books, said, Ms. Randalls, who established the code of practice for UFO investigators, is also an expert on the mysterious circular patterns that suddenly appear in fields in 35 countries around the world and she has supplied the Herald with the first known photo of a UFO above crop circles, which probably have a natural rather than extraterrestrial explanation. These circles have been happening for 450 years. If it's an alien intelligence trying to communicate with us, they're not doing a very good job, she said. The revolving white phenomenon seen above crop circles in Cumbria in England in July causes the surrounding cloud to glow. We believe it may depict the plasma formed in the air by the rotating electrical forces responsible for the circles. She said 30 witnesses have seen the formation of crop circles in which the flattened plants are delicately interwoven. I'll just break in here and say... Uh, What? This is a very good case of how something is simply reported, then uh, assumed to be fact. And she's saying that uh, the formation of crop circles, uh, which the flattened plants are delicately interwoven, as if it's a fact. No, when crop circles are made by stalk stompers, by mortals, um, the pattern is uniform, somewhat chaotic. It's it's a bit random. It's not a case of being delicately interwoven. Anyway, we read on. The most likely explanation so far is a novel type of atmospheric vortex, similar to a willy-willy or hurricane. And just quickly, a willy-willy is like a, uh, a mini tornado, um, usually in the outback of Australia, most, mostly of dust. Scientists had generated rotating columns of electrified air which can produce similar effects in the lab, she said. Ms. Randalls is keen to learn from participants at the Sydney conference the common characteristics of Australia's aliens. She said the former British police officer had been closely interrogated by psychologists 
and his 1987 photograph subjected to many tests. But nothing can dent the credibility of this case. Um, okay, 33 years later. Um, strange that uh, that story has been lost to the uh, mists of time, if it were true. And now once again from Sydney Morning Herald, back even further in time to 1972, the 2nd of July. And this was after the big UFO um, fad of the 50s and some years before the giant UFO fad of the mid to late 1970s, early 1980s. A bumper year for flying saucers, say experts. By Rob Barrand. Sydney UFO researchers say Australia is in for a bumper year for flying saucer sightings and landings. Goodness. Their calculations show overlapping astrological conditions, which they say traditionally result in spates of UFO sightings. One group has already recorded more than 100 sightings and half a dozen landings <coughs> of spacecraft. Oh dear. <clears throat> of spacecraft this year to support its forecast that 1972 will be a high point of UFO activity. Flying saucer researcher Frank Wilkes said in Sydney this week that the Earth's 26 monthly close opposition cycle with Mars was coinciding with an unexplained five yearly pattern of natural disasters, bushfires, volcanic eruptions, and earthquakes. Mr. Wilkes, who believes alien craft have the ability to absorb energy, says these are the periods when flying saucers are most numerous in the Earth's atmosphere. He said, A lot of people think flying saucers are there as observers, but I hold with the theory that they have found a way of absorbing energy. Some people think, including myself, that flying saucers caused the New York blackout of a few years ago. They caused a power overload. They caused a few in Australia too. But there's no need to fear direct action from these craft. I think they are only hostile to the point that they don't care a damn about us. If we happen to get in their way, that's just too bad. Don't like strong light. Mr. Wilkes is director of the Unidentified Flying Object Research Projects of Australia and a key official of UFOIC, Unidentified Flying Object Investigation Centre. His advice to anyone who sees a UFO is simple. Don't go near it. Some people have been known to suffer bad effects, such as loss of memory. He said, It seems the best protection is to use a strong light on them. Light is the only thing that will penetrate their force field. Mr. Wilkes' organisation has checked out a number of reported UFO landings this year, including one in Tokoroa, New Zealand, I hope I pronounced that correctly, and another on the Toligi Hill, South Australia property of Mr. Rob Habner. But perhaps the most incredible sighting, said Mr. Wilkes, was experienced by a New South Wales couple who were hunting on a property near Young two months ago. And Young is a regional centre here in New South Wales. They saw an object with a 40-foot dome of coloured lights, he said. The woman felt a tingling sensation and had a feeling that someone wanted them to observe her. Mr. Wilkes said the couple watched the craft for an hour and 29 minutes, and at one stage the woman fired at it with a shotgun. Now, I would have loved to have been there at that time to see what really went on. And now, skipping around the years, we end up in the year 1986. 1986. Yes, I remember what was going on in 1986, more or less. In the pages of the uh, Sydney Morning Herald, once again, uh, the 14th of September. Australian Connection with Sightings of UFOs by Michael Perry. And it seems Mr. Frank Wilkes is still going strong. Uh, his name is spelt slightly differently in this report. It's missing the E at the end near the S. Nevertheless, it's probably the same fellow. Vivid sighting, Frank Wilkes, with a picture of presumably the same man holding a book about UFOs. 
The flying saucers people spot in Australian skies are small pilot ships sent from a much larger mothership, according to UFO expert Colin Norris. There are large mother craft floating around in space, said Mr Norris, director of the Australian International UFO Research, Inc. They recycle their byproducts. They live, breathe and die on board. When they are in close proximity to something interesting, they send off a smaller craft. To make it even simpler for the layman to grasp, he added, Look, it's not as if the people on Alpha Centauri say, Oh, we'll go down to Earth today, like we catch a plane somewhere. Mr Norris was speaking to the Sun-Herald against the background of an amazing boom in the UFO cult. Interesting that they would use that term. In the UFO cult in the United States. He estimates there are 100 to 150 sightings each day around the world, and Australia, with its clear skies, is an ideal environment for UFO watching. Frank Wilkes, president of the UFO Research Projects of Australasia, first sighted a UFO above Camperdown when he was 17. 35 years later, he still recalls the sighting vividly. It looked like a cigar with the ends bitten off. He explains, The whole thing was bigger than a jumbo and metallic. It had no wings or tail. I was in awe with my mouth open. I began jumping up and down and people ran out. I pointed up to where it was, but it had gone in a blink of an eye. While Mr. Wilkes' UFO was cigar-shaped, most UFOs are huge, bell-shaped, or upside-down, saucer-shaped objects, says Mr. Norris. A recent opinion poll came to the Stunning conclusion that more than half the U.S. population believes in flying saucers. The man who has become the leading expert in North America's UFO cult is Douglas Curran, a Canadian-born photographer. During a period of seven years, Mr. Curran travelled 125,000 kilometres visiting UFO clubs. He interviewed UFO watchers for whom belief has become a faith and he photographed them. His just-published book, In Advance of the Landing, Folk Concepts of Outer Space, is a gripping account of the cultists who are in regular touch with extraterrestrial beings and their spaceships out of the twilight zone. However, after his long years of research, Mr. Curran, 34, concluded that his subjects were not simply cranks and quacks. One of the most interesting things about most of them is their normality, said Mr. Curran. They are white, mostly Protestant, urban or suburban. There are more of them in California and in the South, although I've found some in Michigan and Canada. They are people with cars, with jobs, not hermits, not people struggling for the basics of life. His most incredible memory was members of the Unarius, and I think not sure how that's pronounced, but we'll go over that. For those of you who want to know, U-N-A-R-I-U-S, Anarius Conclave of Light. The Anarians were founded in 1954 by Ruth and Ernest L. Norman, with headquarters in El Cajun, California. They believe that the Earth is constantly observed by the Space Brothers of the Intergalactic Confederation, and that if we on Earth raise our consciousnesses enough, we may be allowed to become the 33rd member of the Confederation, he recalled. And the organization's conclave, held in the Town and Country Convention Center in San Diego? It began with a fanfare and Ravel's Bellero on tape, as a man in a white and purple toga ushered in a procession of maidens strewing rose petals, a wise man carrying a book of life, and finally, Ruth Norman. Since her husband's death in 1971, Ruth has realized her identity as the Archangel Uriel. She was brought in on a palanquin carried by Nubian slaves. Everyone was dressed in costumes from their past lives on their respective planets. There are about 400 of them. It was high mass and a day at the Colosseum, wrapped into one. And we have another little insert here in the same story. Coast sighting convinced six of us. 
a firm believer in UFOs, is assistant editor of the Sun-Herald, Judy Johnson, who reports, It was just after Christmas 1975, and I was sunbaking on a beach on the central coast of New South Wales. And that, incidentally, is just uh, a couple of hours north of Sydney. With me were five adults, including a mining engineer, and as the sun was not yet over the yardarm, none of us had drunk a drop of alcohol. Feeling that my back had been toasted long enough, I turned over and looked up into the cloudless sky. That's when I saw it, a huge silver thing way above. Good grief, what's that? I cried. We studied it for a few moments. The mining engineer said, I never thought I'd hear myself saying this, but I can only assume it's a UFO. The object was the type usually described by UFO spotters as cigar-shaped. It had no wings, no windows that we could see, and its rounded rear end was reddish-orange. We watched it move slowly in a north-westerly direction, so fascinated that we forgot to alert our various children who were playing nearby. Mine have not forgiven me. I read few newspapers when on holidays, so after returning to Sydney a week later, I looked through back copies to see what I'd missed. There, in print, were reports of other sightings of the, quote, huge silver cigar-shaped object, end quote. A member of the UFO Investigation Centre, after hearing I'd seen it, contacted me. It's been flying around the Central Coast area for a few days. He said, we don't know what it's doing. Oh, those Australian UFOs. I wonder why the aliens come to visit Australia from time to time. I thought they were almost exclusively visiting North America. <laughs> if you look at a, a world map of UFO sightings, it's, it's amazing that any um, civil aircraft can fly around the United States at all. They, keep, they would keep bumping into um, aliens. Ah, but I can hear the UFO believers cry. It doesn't work that way. Well, maybe they're right. But what does work, if you go to your local library or you go online to various uh, archive sites, like trove at trove.nla.gov.au, you never know, you never know what UFOs you might find. Thank you for listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast and once again, a very happy 80th birthday to Dick Smith. Now, as you would have heard during today's episode, yes, I'm delighted to announce that I will be appearing at the We Can Reason conference in Calgary, Canada on the 4th of May. And my friends, you can do me a favor if you know anybody in Canada at all. Maybe you've heard of a Canadian. Wayne Gretzky, he'll do. Let them know. Let them know the We Can Reason conference will be in Calgary, and you can book your tickets by following the links in this week's show notes. Or just Google We Can Reason Calgary. It's a wonderful conference. I had such a great time there last year, and I'll be there once again bending spoons all over the place. In fact, I'll be giving a talk on how to bend spoons, how to do water divining, and, as we discussed earlier in the show, I'll be demonstrating how those people who do the, uh, the power balance tests with the body balance tricks, how that's really done. And uh, it's a great way for you to be forearmed, so to speak, so you won't fall for the trick if somebody tries to play it on you. Again, do me a favor. If you know anybody in Canada, please let them know about the Weekend Reason conference coming up on the 4th of May in Calgary. Thank you to those new people who have signed up with Patreon or PayPal to become sponsors of the Skeptic Zone. And apologies, I haven't got back to some of you yet. Um, international travel and other things have come up, which makes things 
a little difficult <laughs> for me to focus right now, but I will be thanking you personally. If not already, then soon. But thank you very much for helping to support The Skeptic Zone. And to my continuing supporters, thank you very much. And a big shout out to Dr. Carl Kruzelniski. I had the pleasure of having a cup of coffee with Carl a couple of days ago. And we spoke of many things, many things over the course of an hour. But mostly, I think, we were discussing podcasting and recording and uh, what are you using and what's this device do and what microphone do you have? <laughs> I was geeking out a bit with Dr. Carl. It was a, a great morning. And finally, our guest from last week, Alanta Colley, will be beginning her, uh, her show Trick or Treatment at the Butterfly Club in Melbourne. And I encourage you to go along to see that show. That is from 8.30, 25th to the 31st of March. Trick or Treatment. And you can find out more by visiting her website, alantacolly.com, with links in this week's show notes. And who knows, if you go to see Alanta's show in the coming week, you might bump into a certain Skeptic Zone reporter. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for episodes and show notes with links going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone on Facebook, X, TikTok and YouTube by clicking the links at our homepage, together with links to support the show financially via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed by our guests are not necessarily those of the Skeptic Zone podcast or any other sceptical organisation. Okay, hi. This is Tim Mendham and I'm the Book of Tim. But of course, uh, over the last few months, we've had a bit of, uh, bit of analysis of the way that we're doing this and uh, looking at the technology and the platforms that we're using. So we have decided to upgrade. And from now on, this won't be the book of Tim. This will be the cassette tape of Tim. We've got the latest tech. <laughs>